Jesus Christ said, I will build my church. For more than 2,000 years, he's been doing all that he promised. Today, his church remains an assembly of his saints, providing a place for worship, fellowship, and instruction. In a world that often feels isolated and alone, church remains a place to connect. It's a place to call home. We're so glad you've chosen to connect with the family of believers at Campus Church in the Crown Center at Pensacola Christian College, as together we rejoice in the Lord. If you would take your Bibles, join me today, Genesis chapter number 20. The title of our message today is The Collateral Damage of Compromise. The Collateral Damage of Compromise. You know, in a serious situation, in a war environment, collateral damage is the sad reality of a battle between two warring parties that spills over into the lives of those that have nothing to do with the war. They simply become entangled in someone else's war. And of course, there is something of collateral damage in the Christian life. We, we oftentimes refer to believers, and rightly so, a, a church as a body of believers. So we understand that, that when we are representative of the body of Christ, we also understand that when one member, part of that body, has some struggle, it is not limited to that part of the body. That struggle then spills over into other parts of the body. Romans 12, 5, so we being many are one body in Christ and everyone members one of another. This means that there's a connection. In Christianity, of course, in our church, in the body of Christ, there is a shared life. It means that one person's decisions often impact others. Now, to varying degrees, that's true, but impact others, our decisions do. Paul said it this way. Paul said, for none of us liveth to himself and no man dieth to himself. You know, sometimes we take the position like, hey, just get off my back. This, this is just about me. It's not about you, but... If we really pause and consider who we are in the body of Christ, we can't say that my actions don't impact yours or yours mine. Sometimes we use the expression when attempting to justify our poor decisions. Well, I'm not hurting anyone else. But the truth is we, we may well be. As we look at this passage today... We're going to notice how our decisions and the compromise of one man impacted the lives of many. We might call it collateral damage. The first thing we're going to notice in our passage today, and your Bibles are open to Genesis chapter 20. The first thing we're going to notice is an unwise relocation. An unwise relocation. We're about to see something that, that happens regarding a geographic move. This is not what we would call, oh, he was making some vast spiritual decision. He's just making a geographic move. He's moving from one location to the next. And we might wonder, well, what's the big deal about that? Notice in your Bibles, Genesis chapter 20, verse number 1. And Abraham journeyed from thence toward the south country and dwelled between Kadesh and Shur. And sojourned in Gerar. Now I'm going to submit that this move appears to be rather abrupt. And if you paused and asked the question, why is Abraham moving? The answer is we really don't know. We don't have any backstory to this. We don't have any, any even allusion to. Now we might draw some conclusions. So we might conclude, well, you understand what just happened in Sodom. And, and maybe as Abraham looks out and he sees the, the charred remains of these four cities, the Confederate cities with Sodom, as they're consumed and they become nothing but brimstone and waste. Maybe he says, well, I, I just can't stay here anymore. But for whatever reason, reasons that are left only to conjecture we know that Abraham all of a sudden up and moves. 
Now, when Abraham first moved to Haran, when he first moved from Haran, he had a very clear understanding, confirmation, instruction regarding what it is that God was doing regarding his location. So there was no question. In fact, the Bible says Genesis 12, verse number one, if we do a little mental review. Now the Lord had said unto Abram, get thee out of thy country, from thy kindred, from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee. Abram knew at that time, I'm supposed to get up and get going. But we don't have any kind of instruction from God now. We find ourselves in Genesis chapter 20 and all of a sudden Abraham up and he moves. For some 20 years, Abraham had been dwelling in Hebron. The, the, the name Hebron, it means the idea of fellowship. Like I have, I have something that I'm sharing together with you. Hebron, fellowship. And that's what Abraham had been in this place, a person who's in fellowship with God. He's worshiping God. He's meeting with God. But now, again, with no apparent prompting from God, Abraham moves. Now, maybe he's looking for better pasture, maybe for some reason unknown to us, but Abraham moves himself. And by the way, when he moves himself, he's moving now the many people that are with Abraham. We know that sometime prior, he armed the people that were in his own house as soldiers to go rescue the, the people of Sodom when Lot was taken captive by others. 318 armed in his own house. So when Abraham announces, hey, hey, we're, we're gonna pack up and we're gonna move, this is not only gonna impact him, it's not only going to impact, of course, his wife, Sarah, and, and then Hagar and, and the child, Ishmael. It's going to impact a whole host of people. And then we're going to notice that he goes up to sojourn in a land, to sojourn in Gerar. The word sojourn, it means to turn aside from the road or to stay as a guest. It's kind of like you don't really belong there. You're just a passing through. And Abraham had now turned off the road. He's making his lodging as a guest in Gerar. And, and if you haven't already drawn this conclusion or at least asked the question, well, well, where's Gerar? Gerar is a Philistine city. So now he leaves the land of promise, the land of Canaan, the land of fellowship, Hebron, and he goes to Gerar. He's going to a Philistine city and he's going to lodge there. Obviously, Lot made a poor choice in moving his family to Sodom. So we get that. And, and we oftentimes talk about the consequence of Lot's decision to pitch his tent towards the well-watered plains. And then finally, we find him seated in the gates of Sodom. And we give Lot his, his just, uh, you know, understanding that he did the wrong thing there. But I feel like at times we may be a little soft on Abraham. Because Abraham up and moves his family and he moves to Gerar, the Philistine city. If you and I were passing by Gerar, I mean, we're just, we're just passing through and we see someone we know and, oh, hey, hey, sweetheart, isn't that Abraham? And there's Sarah. Hey, Abraham. Now, here's the question we might ask. What are you doing here? What are you doing here? Has anyone ever found you someplace? And, and not that it was necessarily morally wrong. They just didn't anticipate seeing you there. And so they see you and all of a sudden it's like, hey, what are you doing here? Do you remember when God asked Elijah, his prophet in 1 Kings chapter 19, the same question? Do you remember that? Because Elijah, he says, I've had it with this. And, and he gets this threatening, you know, life altering, uh, uh, you know, a statement from the queen. I'm going to take your life. You're going to be from Jezebel, like one of the prophets that you just slew on Mount Carmel. You're going to be like them by this time tomorrow. And so Elijah, he, he up and heads out. And God asks him on multiple occasions, what doest thou here, Elijah? What are you doing here? Uh, I'll tell you what I'm doing here. I've been very jealous for you. And, and God just lets Elijah talk, but eventually comes back and he asks the same question again. What doest thou here, Elijah? 
God had clearly called Elijah to the land of Israel. He'd used him as a prophet to speak powerfully to his people, but God had not called him out of active duty and he certainly hadn't called him to hide in the wilderness. You and I are called to stay at the place to which God has called us and not move until he has called us away to our next place of service. You know, when anyone ever comes and and asks the question, um, hey, do you think I should make this move? Well, I can't answer that question, but we can ask the question, are you confident that God is directing you to this decision? Are you confident? I mean, how often do we look at some other situation with a grass is always greener mentality? Wow, that's so appealing to me. That's so attractive. And and like Lot, the well-watered plains, that is some green grass over there. Certainly better than than what I'm exposed to and have have to live with here. Boy, that's such a better circumstance. And I wonder how often you and I are driven to make a move, so to speak, because of the grass is greener mentality. Again, I don't know all that was playing in the mind of Abraham, but I can't help but think he's processing it's got to be better there than it is here. Abraham, Gerar, the Philistine city, what are you doing here? You know, what are the implications of this? Well, it means that you don't pack up your family and move until God has clearly indicated it's time to do so. And clearly God does do so. Just don't rush ahead of God. It means finish what God has called you to do. We would ask the question, did God call you to a place of service? That could be your vocation. Okay, so God's called you vocationally to this place of service. Don't go to the next place until you know God has called you to do so. Now, he does make that plain. He shows you this is exactly what I want you to do. But don't draw conclusions for God until God has given those conclusions. Your vocation. We might even take that another step further when we're asking this question about has God called you to a place of service? What about your volunteering? Your volunteering. Do you know, sometimes we, I get this, and please, I'm not trying to put undue guilt on any of us. Sometimes all of us need to step back for a moment and say, I I do need a time of rest. It's time for me to come apart and rest a while. But unless God has just removed you from a place of service, even in our volunteering, we can kind of get in that mentality of, well, you know, there's somebody else that will do that. Uh, that that's exactly what other people are for and we've backed away at times just from our offering to the Lord Lord I used to do this I served here I was involved in that and and sometimes that little I'm going to come apart and rest a while becomes like wow that's my new norm well don't step away from things until God has clearly directed you to do so and then when God directs don't hesitate to take the next step Well, remember when Abraham said it's time to pack up and move, the impact of that decision was going to impact far more than just himself. The collateral damage would be far reaching and it began with a decision that as far as we can tell was done apart from God. Okay, an unwise relocation. Let's look a little bit further in the passage. And the second thing we see is an undeniable reality. An undeniable reality. Okay, hey, everybody, don't you wish that at times the Bible would remain silent about certain things? I mean, honestly, I wish that at times, like, oh, do we have to look at that? Because it's not pleasant to look at. To me, it's one of the the evidences of divine inspiration because God includes things about mankind that man would have never included in Scripture. And we're going to see an undeniable reality here as well. There's a place on the campus of Pensacola Christian College that I have oftentimes gone to to study. It is a quiet room and a quiet place and and I can just go in there and focus and study and, and it's a good place for me to do so. 
I was seated at my computer and I'm studying. Uh, I'm in there one time and do you know how sometimes a little noise doesn't fully register in your consciousness, but kind of the subconscious, you hear it happening. And there was some little noise that was taking place and I just heard it almost in my subconscious, but it kept going and, and it wasn't this, this pattern. It was erratic. It was this tapping noise and I couldn't quite figure out what in the world am I hearing. And finally, it, it, it inserted itself to the forefront of my thought. It interrupted my study. And so I'm, now I'm turning around to try to figure out what in the world am I hearing? Well, upon a little investigation, I found that there was this beautiful cardinal, uh, b- beautiful red cardinal. And I look and this cardinal keeps flying up against the window, beak first. Tap, 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 pat. I mean, the cardinal just keeps going against the window. And I'm like, what in the world? And so I, I look, you know, I, I, I get close to the window and he just keeps flying against, repeatedly, this cardinal's flying against the window. Well, you know, finally I'm tired of this. So, you know, you kind of get in the window and it's like, knock on the window and the cardinal flies away. Okay, we're all done. Well, listen, I'm in there studying again, another time. I'm studying away and it, here it comes again, tap, 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 tap. And, and I, oh, there he is again. This happens repeatedly. I mean, continually, I'm watching this cardinal. He keeps coming back. So now I'm kind of curious. I even had my phone out. I'm videoing this guy. I named him. I named him, I named him Carl, the crazy cardinal, okay? <laughs> because Carl keeps flying against the, the, the glass and he keeps, bam, bam. He keeps hitting, hitting, hitting. This is not, I'm not kidding about this. I watch and I'm studying Carl because he just keeps flying against the glass. And um, I look and there's the female cardinal. And she's just standing, she's actually perched and she's watching Carl. And she's going like, I'm mostly not kidding, okay? But she was really sitting there and she's just watching Carl. It's like, here we go again. You and I understand, okay, There is a reality that you and I do dumb things. The challenge that I have with my dumb things is oftentimes I do dumb things repeatedly. And then I do do the same dumb thing again. Do you know what we're about to see with, with Father Abraham had many sons. This hero of the faith, Father Abraham, the one in whom all the nations of the earth will be blessed. The the one by whom the seed will come and the serpent's head will be crushed. Do you know what we're about to see in the life of Abraham? We're about to see him do the same thing that he did previously that apparently he didn't learn the lesson from before. You know, the difference between between me and, and of course, my, my little cardinal friend, Carl, is that you and I are supposed to know better. The undeniable reality that we're speaking of here is that believers, of course, do sin. And not only do we sin, we often sin repeatedly, often repeating the same sin. In Genesis chapter 20, verse number two, the Bible says, and Abraham said of Sarah, his wife, Here it is again. She is my sister. And Abimelech, king of Gerar, sent and took Sarah. So what was Abraham doing in his lie to Abimelech? Simply this. He was asking himself, what will this do for me? Instead of how am I protecting others? Lying, which I'm submitting, is exactly what Abraham did. Lying is primarily about how I can get out of something that I don't want or how I can get something that I do want. Ultimately, lying is manipulating the facts to get something I desire that I don't believe the truth will provide. So I'm going to lie Because I want to get something. I want to get out of something. I want something that if I tell the truth, the truth will not provide it. So I'm going to play fast and loose with the facts because I'm attempting to get something that the truth will not provide. And that's exactly what Abraham is doing. 
Abraham is saying, I'm going to have to, we're going to have to play with the facts a little bit here. And um, we're going to present some things. Listen, it's not really a whole lie. It's just like a half truth. And you and I know far better than that. Your mothers taught you, as did mine, that, that a half truth is actually a whole lie. And that's what Abraham is about to tell. You know, and Abraham had been the recipient on multiple occasions of the reiterated promise of God, stating that by his offspring, the nations would be blessed, the seed would come. What a record of following God. What a record of the blessings of God. If we were to look at his life from the vantage point of history, we know that he is one of the giants of the faith whose name is recorded in the hall of faith in Hebrews 11. But what do we now see Abraham do once again that didn't work the first time? Do you remember what he did? And there was a famine in the land and Abraham went down to Egypt to sojourn there. For the famine was grievous in the land. And it came to pass when he was come near unto Egypt that he said to Sarai, his wife, Behold now, I know that thou art a fair woman to look upon. Therefore it shall come to pass when the Egyptians shall see thee, they shall say, This is his wife and they will kill me. But they will save thee alive. Say, I pray thee, thou art my sister, that it may be well with me for thy sake, and my soul shall live because of thee. Can you imagine what Sarah must have experienced in Egypt when she's taken into the harem of Pharaoh? God was merciful to Abraham and to Sarah. He extended mercy that in no way they deserved. But that's the point of mercy, isn't it? It's never deserved. And how did Pharaoh respond to Abraham when he learned the truth about Sarah, Abraham's wife? And the Lord plagued Pharaoh and his house with great plagues because of Sarai, Abram's wife. And Pharaoh called Abram and said, what is this that thou hast done unto me? Why didst thou not tell me that she was thy wife? Why saidst thou she's my sister? So I might have taken her to me to wife. Now therefore, behold thy wife. Take her and go thy way. It appears that what happens to Abraham and Sarah in Egypt is now being repeated in the land of Philistia. The the exact same scenario is unfolding before us. Verse number three, but God came to Abimelech in a dream by night and said unto him, now think about this, if God shows up and he says this to you, behold, thou art but a dead man for the woman which thou hast taken For she is a man's wife. God noticed, God did not say, she is his half-sister. No, God said, she is his wife. And Abraham had been attempting to compromise the truth. To make a little more room for the facts than the truth would allow. And by the way, before we get too far removed from this, we again just understand that the Bible is exposing our hero as someone who's made out of the same stuff that you are made out of. Same stuff that I am made out of. It it presents the realities of our humanity. Now the challenge that Abraham is having is that he is what we oftentimes call compartmentalizing his life. Now don't miss this because we are so prone to compartmentalizing our lives. Okay, how many of you have... um, How many of you have, let's have a show of hands, how many of you have what we commonly refer to as a junk drawer at home? How many of you have one of those? Okay. How many of you, all of your drawers are junk drawers? Okay. (laughs) A few of you. All right. So usually we have a drawer at home that defies organization. So, uh, you know, hey, hey, mom, where are the, and she says, "Uh, they're in the, they're in the junk drawer. Okay. And so you go and you pull out and it's just this assortment of everything and they don't go anywhere else. We'll just put that in the junk drawer. Do you know, sometimes in our Christianity, we like to conveniently have what we call our our spiritual little junk drawer. That's not my church drawer. That's not my friend drawer. Uh, that's my, that's my uh, in fact, I don't really want other people to, to pull up in the junk drawer because it's a little embarrassing. But we have this little spiritual junk drawer. And we feel like if all the other drawers are properly organized, I mean, that things are labeled in there. They're looking nice. They're organized fully. It's okay for us to have our spiritual junk drawer. 
Because I can, I can, hey man, everybody's got a junk drawer. And, and why shouldn't I? And I'll just keep that one there. I'll put the things that are unsightly, things I don't want anybody to see. I'll just put that in my junk drawer. And then I'm going to go serve the Lord in other areas and it's all going to be good. Because those drawers are in really good shape. What is Abraham doing in some way, shape or form right now? In some way, Abraham is saying, Listen, I, I know, I'm, I'm, I'm believing God. Did he believe God? Well, well, of course he does. What's he doing here? Here he is not walking by faith. He is walking by sight. David prayed this prayer. He said, teach me thy way, O Lord. I will walk in thy truth. Now notice this. Unite my heart to fear thy name. Unite my heart to fear thy name. He's saying, God, I don't want this little drawer in my heart and this little drawer in my heart. I don't want my heart to have this division where, okay, I can do this part here, but I can't do that part here. Unite my heart. God, give me a singular heart to fear thy name. And further, we realize again that we never, as a part of the body of Christ, we never sin alone. Whether one member suffer, all the members suffer with it. It's telling us, listen, there is something of shared experience within the body of Christ. So why does he lie? I'd offer just briefly three excuses for his lie. Three excuses. Number one, he didn't believe that God was everywhere. He doesn't believe that God is everywhere. Listen, we're going to get to Gerar. And, and I know this is a Philistine you know, city. Jehovah God doesn't live there. And Abraham said, because I thought surely the fear of God is not in this place. And they will slay me for my wife's sake. God doesn't live here. I, I, I'd, love to, I'd love to, you know, talk about God, but God is not in Gerar. And so the fear of God, absent from here, I, I can't talk about him. I can't make trusting decisions for God here. This was years ago, and, and uh, Julie and I were on our adoption quest. We were in the heart of Russia where we adopted our son. And the next day in Russia, we had to stand before a judge and the judge was going to inquire about us to see if they would approve the adoption. It was a big deal and I was nervous the, the night before I'm processing and like, what am I going to say tomorrow to the judge? What, what are they going to ask me? Am I going to tell them that I'm a Christian? And you know the passage that I read the morning that we were supposed to go see the judge was Genesis chapter 20. I'm in Genesis 20 and I read about Abraham saying, surely the fear of God's not in this place. And I thought, surely the fear of God is in this place. And the next day we were the first ones to stand before the judge. So we didn't get to see anybody else, what the judge was going to do, how they'd respond. And the judge started to ask us questions like, hey, um, oftentimes uh, children could have some significant challenges because of the challenges that, that could be physical. They could be drug related from their parents. There, there could be a whole slew of issues. What are you going to do if you face those challenges and it is far more difficult than you anticipated? So, well, what am I going to do? I said, well, um, I am a Christian and I believe that God has directed this child to this couple and that he has intended for this child to be a part of our family. And the judge paused and then it's like, what's the judge gonna say? And then she, all of this is through an interpreter and, and she said, I too am a Christian. I'm like, whoa, the fear of God is in this place, okay? And then she said, I also believe that God is the one who puts children specifically with specific families. And then she said, in fact, I have seen that so much that so often the children physically reflect the parents that have adopted them. And, you know, we left that day with an understanding that the fear of God is not limited to a geographic location. The fear of God is that which we understand. God, you are everywhere present. What does he do? Well, he first of all, he didn't believe that God was everywhere. Number two, he thought a half truth was sufficient. He thought a half truth was sufficient. And yet indeed she is my sister. She is the daughter of my father, but not the daughter of my mother. And she became my wife. 
Abraham, you tried that before and it was unacceptable. You're using it again and it is just as unacceptable as it was before. And number three, he blamed God for his circumstances. Uh, It's okay for me to lie because God's the one who put me in this circumstance. And it came to pass, Genesis 20, 13, when God caused me to wander. This is Abraham speaking. And it came to pass when God caused me to wander from my father's house that I said unto her, this is thy kindness which thou shalt do unto me. At every place whither we shall come, say of me, he is my brother. When God caused me to wander... This is the language of the unbelieving. This is not the language of one who says, listen, I've been taking steps of faith ever since God called me. Well, God's the one who caused me to wander. And so because of that, I've had to take some very specific action. All of this is ultimately about Abraham. He simply wasn't trusting that God was enough. And by the way, there's an escalation of his sin as well. Abraham, since the time God first called him out of Haran, Abraham has received incredible revelation from God. And all of that, it seems to take a backseat. Look at the last thing. We see an unwise relocation, an undeniable reality. And now we see God interject an undeserved response. God is unwaveringly faithful. There is no shadow of turning when it comes to our God. He is perfectly faithful. The only question left to answer is not, is God faithful? But rather, do you and I believe he is? We're not asking, God, are are you going to be faithful? The only question is, do you and I believe that he is? So did Abraham believe God? Well, what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God and it was counted unto him for righteousness. The problem is he wasn't living like he believed God. Listen, Campus Church, do you believe God? We we would say, well, yes, I believe God. Are we living like we believe God? Notice, you know, when, when you think about how does he respond, notice how God responds. And Abimelech took sheep and oxen and men servants and women servants and gave them unto Abraham and restored him Sarah, his wife. And Abimelech said, behold, my land is before thee. Dwell where it pleaseth thee. And unto Sarah, he said, behold, I have given thy brother. I think that's a little dig right there for Sarah. And for Abraham, behold, I have given thy brother a thousand pieces of silver. That's an incredible amount of money. Behold, he is to thee a covering of the eyes. Unto all that are with thee and with all other, thus she was reproved. God protects Sarah God blesses Abraham. God preserves the integrity of the Abrahamic line. Have you paused to think of the collateral damage that Abraham was about to inflict because of his unwise decision? He put Sarah in a place where her purity could be compromised. Abraham puts the integrity of Isaac's birth into question. Can you imagine if Abimelech had taken Sarah as his wife? Even Isaac may have questioned who his real father is. Have you thought about the collateral damage that he's subjecting others to because of his faithless decisions? He thought he could manipulate his way through the challenges rather than simply put his trust in God. How does God respond to these undeserved lack of of faithful decisions on the part of Abraham? Well, notice how God provides an undeserved response. First of all, explicitly three times in the passage, we're told that Abimelech had not laid a hand on Sarah. He hadn't even come near unto Sarah. This is the undeserved mercy of God. And and then let me ask you this. How many times has God kept you back from some tragic sin? How many times have you full well intended to do that which you knew was in defiance against God? And God in his mercy said, I'm I'm going to demonstrate my mercy to you. And God withheld you from that which you full well planned to do. God was withholding the foolishness of Abraham's decisions. And then the next thing that we see is God tells Abimelech that he is a dead man if he doesn't return Sarah to her husband. You and I might reason Abraham lied, so let him deal with the consequences. Again, we see God's undeserved response. God is protecting his promise. He's securing his covenant. 
in spite of Abraham's actions, not because of them. And that's the way God works. God works in faithful fashion, not because we are so good, but because he is so good. The Bible says in 2 Timothy 2.13, if we believe not, yet he is faithful, he cannot deny himself. Aren't you grateful that God is faithful even when you and I are not? Now, ultimately, do you know what God is doing here? He's not ignoring Abraham's sin. He's actually protecting his plan that will deal with Abraham's sin. God is overseeing and preserving the promised seed. How great is our God. You know, in conclusion, when you and I trust ourselves, rather than place our trust in God, we are placing not only ourselves, but those around us in tremendous danger. The question we must ask is, who can do a better job of taking care of you? You or your God? The question obviously is an obvious answer. It seems like the straightforward understanding is God can do the job better than can we. So finally, who are you trusting? By God's grace and his mercy, may we place our trust in him. We're glad you joined us for Rejoice in the Lord. You can connect with us anytime at rejoicetv.org or on demand where streaming content is found. Your tax-deductible gift is vital to help sustain this ministry. Your support for Rejoice in the Lord enables us to spread the gospel around the world. Encouraging Christians and reaching people for Jesus, this is Rejoice in the Lord.